there. Okay, we are now recording. And this is my usual tablet screen when, you know, I'm going to get to it in a few minutes. All right, so we have, do we, does anyone want me to go over the solution of the homework assignment? Yes? Okay. All right, we'll do that. Of course, we can ask uh, Chat GPT to do it. But we already know GP, Chat GPT cannot do this, which is kind of ironic, you know, because you know, this is all very mechanical kind of stuff, and yet, you know, Chat GPT with all the computational hardware supporting it cannot do this. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is your homework assignment. This is the original expression. Uh, and because I really do not like to type, you know, in mathematical symbols, I simplify it to the way that I typically use in class. And I'm going to use a notepad to do this, you know, because you know, plain text you know, can do this already which is also why I choose to use this particular format, because you know, this is very plain text you know, friendly, like so. All right, so I did this once already at home. You know, I cannot remember how I did it, uh, got it done. So I'm gonna redo it now, you know, just you know, kind of impromptu. All right, <clears throat> so the typical uh, way that I do things, you know, and you can either copy and paste you know, this approach if you want to, or you know you can just go with whatever you want to do. I just you'll know, convert all the implications into or and negation first. You know that's usually the first thing I have I do. Um, so that is now done, and then the next thing I do is to take out unnecessary parentheses. Um, basically, I just want it to be easier to read from the human perspective. So when you look at this, you know this pair of parentheses is not needed. I can only I can you know have the cursor on one, it highlights the other one. This pair of parentheses uh, is not needed because of association, because you have you know, a or in parentheses, and then outside of the parentheses, you also have just an or, so the parentheses are not needed. So I take out you know, unnecessary parentheses because it makes it a little bit harder to read from my perspective. So now I have something that's a little bit more cleaned up, um, and then we have a negation on the outside. So this negation applies to a conjunction. There is a hidden conjunction right here. So the negation on the outside, you know, this negation here is applied to the conjunction over here, which means, you know, I'm going to have to use the Morgan's law to move the negation to be as to be right next to variables as much as possible. So the next step is uh, the Morgan's law. So let me go ahead and document. This is the definition of implication. This one is association, and now we are using De Morgan's law. So when you apply De Morgan's law, what you're doing, okay? So copy and paste is best in this case uh, because you know this way I don't have to risk making errors when I'm copying. So basically, you negate the components of the operator that is being negated, and then you change the operator. If it was an and, you turn it into an or. If it was an or, you turn it into an and. So with this one, you know, this is the Morgan's law. I'm just going to use DM to represent the Morgan's law. And after that, the outermost parentheses are not needed anymore, so I just take them out. Are we still doing okay so far with the explanation? Okay, all right. So after this, I apply the Morgan's law again because you know, we have a negation applied to an or, and on the other side, we have the same thing, a negation applied to an or. So for each one, I apply the Morgan's law. So um, just doing the same way, you know, copy and paste, and then operate on the individual items. So now I take this negation and distribute it to every item in the original operator, but then all the ors will become ands. Same thing over here. Take this negation. Oops. Uh, um, I just, you know, Click something on the keyboard that I'm not supposed to. There we go. Control X, cut. And this time I have to be careful because you know the negation is applied to the entire conjunction here. So I have to put parentheses around the uh, conjunction. And then we have one extra um, uh, negation over here. So this is also the Morgan's Law, by the way. Do we have any questions up to this step?
Oh, right. We have to change the or into an and. Very good. Forgot to do that. So there we go. All right. And now we can do some simplifications. Okay. So I usually put simplification onto a following line just so that I can see that, you know, I'm, you know, um, applying the negation correctly first. So this is double negation. It can go away. This is also double negation. It goes away. So I'm just going to say simplification here. Simplification. 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 Okay, that sounds about right. <clears throat> All right, so we, now we still have uh, De Morgan's Law because we have a negation of a conjunction in this case. So go ahead and copy and paste. So this negation of a conjunction, distribute the negation in and then change the conjunction to a disjunction, like so. And this is again the you know, De Morgan's Law. So now I'm done with De Morgan's Law because I don't see a negation of an and nor a disjunction of an or anymore. So I'm done with uh, De Morgan's Law. And the question now is uh, we want to get a CNF out of the whole thing. And this is definitely not in CNF because the overall operation is an or. And the components that is ORing on one side is a conjunction. The other one is a mix of a disjunction and a conjunction. So we are definitely not done yet. So what I can also do at this point is, so we have several ways to proceed at this point. Um, you can look at it in multiple perspective. You can look at this and go like, hey, that looks like a, a CNF already, which it is. Okay, and the question is, you know, if this is a CNF already, can I utilize this and turn it into a somehow integrate the other side and turn the entire thing into a CNF? The answer is yes. Okay, you know, we can definitely do that. This is also a CNF, by the way. Okay, so when you are given two CNFs and the two CNFs are connected with an OR, the way you change the whole thing into a overall CNF is distribution. Okay, so let me illustrate you know, the <coughs> distribution that we are talking about. So A is a CNF, okay? So let's say A is already a CNF, and then you have another CNF, which is BC, okay? So now you have you know, a CNF, which is A, and it is ORed with another CNF, which is BC. So the distribution that we are going to apply in this case is, doesn't look natural to us because it doesn't exist in arithmetic, but it does exist in Boolean algebra. So in this case, you know, we have A or B and A or C. That is now an overall you know, CNF. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. Now, the... Um, hmm. So A has to be a A cannot be a CNF, you know, because you know we can also do this kind of stepwise, and we can do it one step at a time. This is already a CNF. All right, let me see. So now we can say, what if it is BCD, right? So if it's BCD, then we just have one more term, which is A or D over here. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Oops. All right. So All right, let's do uh do it in different steps. Just like in normal algebra, you know, sometimes you have to experiment, which is what I'm doing right now. Uh not R and P or not T and P. That's a one way of this doing distribution. And now we have the parentheses are not needed anymore, so we'll take care of that. So we have these parentheses all removed, like so. And we have three CNFs. So if we apply the cross product thing, then we end up with um, a CNF on that side. Yep, okay, that should work. Okay, let me try this first. Okay, let me get rid of these two steps. 
and then we'll try this one. So we'll, this is what I'm going to, all right. Oh, okay. I got it. I got this. All right. So what we do is we do a cross product thing. All right, so the cross product thing, which is what you usually know as FOIL, is like this, A, B, or uh, C, D, okay? So when you do a FOIL using Boolean algebra, okay, this, is, this only works in Boolean algebra, this becomes A or C, A or D, B or C, B or D, you know, which is kind of the same thing as your usual FOIL, except you switch the addition and the multiplication. So let's try to do that over here. So the, after the FOIL, this is going to look a little bit ugly, but it's okay. So we have P or not R or not T, P or P, not S or not R or not T, uh, not S or P. And then lastly, we have not Q or not R or not T. And then the last one is not Q or P. Okay, there we go. Okay, does everybody understand what just happened here? I did a FOIL, but using the rule of distribution that only works in Boolean algebra. It does not work in normal algebra. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so there are a few things we can do here. Okay, this is definitely not the best format. But if you turn this in, I cannot not give you full credit because you know, the homework assignment only asks that you turn it into a CNF. But guess what? This is CNF. Okay, so, but I'm going to do, a, I, I would try to do a little better. Okay, because this just looks you know, uglier than it needs to be. So the, the one thing, the first thing I'm going to do is to, Look at this one over here, This just this one here. You go like, hey, that's just P by itself. So you might ask, you, why do you prioritize and just you know, deal with that one? Because now we can use absorption and get rid of a whole bunch of terms. Do you guys remember what absorption is? Okay, so in a conjunction, um, in a conjunction of disjunctions, if one disjunction is a general version of another disjunction, you can get rid of the more general one. So in this case, P is the most, the most specific one compared to this one here, or compared to this one over here, or this one over here. So that's, that means you know, in the next line, by using absorption, I can apply that multiple times and get rid of a bunch of terms. So I can get rid of this because it mentions P in it. I can get rid of this because it mentions P in it. And I can also get rid of this term because it mentions P in it. I can get rid of all of those at the same time. So now we have this and I can still do a little bit more refinement because you know, I personally prefer things to be in alphabetical order. You don't have to do this step, okay? You know, if you get to this part here and you say, I'm done, fine, not a problem. Personally, I prefer things to be in, you know, alphabetical order. So I just want to do this. <clears throat> and this one is in alphabetical order already. So that's the uh, end result. Do we have any questions about the solution? Did I make a mistake somewhere? Nope. Okay. Yep. You don't have to comment, you know, but the commenting helps you retrace your steps in case. I, I cannot understand what you're saying, sorry. Oh, you can do the simplification earlier? Yeah, you can factor it out. I mean, there are multiple ways to do this. Yep. 
So you're referring to you're referring to this step here, right? So you basically factor out the p, and then you have not s, not q, or not rt, you know, as the other term. Yeah, yeah, that works too. Yep, that also works. Yeah, there are more than one ways to do it. You know, this is algebra. I mean, you, in most cases of algebra, there are different ways, different ordering at least, you know, of ways to do it. All right. Any additional questions about this one? So I have not yet have the time to prepare the next homework assignment. So, you know, I'm going to work on that, you know, after class today. Um, so expect you know, something, an announcement by the end of the day. It will be due next Wednesday. So you have a week to work on it. Um, it's going to be the same thing that we did on Monday. What did I do on Monday? Hmm? I tied the three things together, right? You know, there are three things that we have been talking about, and they are related, but they together they are going to solve a particular problem, which is proving a theorem, right? All right. So on Monday we talked about CNF. Okay, you know, so I converted, um, I used my generator to generate a random Boolean expression and turn it into CNF. And then we talked about uh, proof by contradiction, right? So proof by contradiction and resolution, exactly. So resolution is a mechanical way to utilize a CNF in order to use proof by contradiction to prove whether a particular proposed theorem is a theorem or not. Now, the mechanical process of resolution is really kind of tedious, okay? If you guys remember, I was pairing up, you know, statement one with statement two. Can they resolve? If they do resolve, you know, what is the end result? Is that result already explored? And so on and so forth. So it's kind of tedious. But in the end, on Monday, we show that the proposed statement was not a theorem because we hit a dead end without, you know, resolving it. So what I will do today is I can show you an example where you know it does work. Okay, you know the end result you know does work. So it's not too difficult to do it. You know the difficult part is to give you a non-trivial example. So I will try my best to come up with an example right now where it does resolve, but it's not trivial either. So we'll say psi is um, p implies q, and um, let me see. P implies Q and not Q. Okay. That's psi. Phi, on the other hand, is simply not P. Okay. So that's you know, what is given to you. So once again, your psi is representing everything that is known, and you're just told. Don't ask me why P implies Q. We just know that it is true. Don't ask me why not Q is true. It is the, the, it's just like that. Phi, on the other hand, is the theorem that you're trying to prove, which means we're trying to find out whether psi implies phi or not in this case. But we are not going to use normal linear algebra, which not, would not be very difficult to do. We're going to use the same technique that we have been talking about, which is converting everything into CNF, and then use resolution and see whether we can resolve everything to false. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. All right, so the first thing is we want psi to be represented in a CNF. In this case, eh, it's not too bad because we are so close already. So because we already have you know, P implies Q and not Q, and we just need one step here, which is not P or Q, getting rid of the implication and not Q, and we are done. Okay, this is the CNF. C and F of psi. There we go. We also want to have a CNF for phi, which is also really, really trivial in this case, because the you know, not phi, not phi, is not not p, which is just p itself. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. So you start with psi. You convert psi to a CNF. You start with phi 
You first negate it first, okay? And then you turn it into a CNF. So now we you know, concatenate the two using conjunction. So now we want to concatenate and have psi and not phi. So we already know, you know what psi looks like. It is not P or Q and not Q. We also, not, we also know what not phi is looking like. You know, it is just P all by itself. So now we have this CNF and then we apply um, resolution to this. So using the same format that we looked at before, I'm gonna number these individual items. So this way, when I do resolution, I can pinpoint which one is which one. So using a more systematic way, I'm gonna look at one and two and ask, can they resolve? Well, that's a pretty easy one, right? Because you know, in order for resolution to work, one disjunction needs to have the variable not negated. The other one needs to have the same variable negated. So do we find a variable that is negated in one but not negated in the other one between one and two? Yeah, that's a pretty easy one to spot. It is Q, right? So by combining one and two, we now have um, just not P left because Q is quote unquote consumed in the resolution process. So I'm just gonna say, you know, um, statement four is the result of resolution using one and two. So now we look at, you know, now you can go for the super systematic way to do things. Um, like, you know, you can look at one and three, but I'm gonna shortcut it, okay? Because I can see the solution already. So I can, now I can say five, which is false using um, three and four. Because three is P, four is not P. So when you resolve these two, you have nothing left. But there's really nothing, it's, it's not nothing left. Because P is really the same thing as P or false. Not P is the same thing as not P or false. So that means the false part is retained because you know, the P and not P are consumed by the resolution. So technically speaking, the result of the resolution from a completely mechanical syntactic perspective is false or false, but guess what? That's just regular false. So now we have false, which means here we can come to the conclusion that phi is a theorem, theorem of psi because the <clears throat> conjunction of psi and phi resolves to false. That's the conclusion. So this is one example of you know, being able to resolve to false, and as a result, we conclude that phi is a theorem of psi. Whereas on Monday, I gave you an example where it does not resolve. Well, it doesn't resolve to zero. It resolves to a bunch of stuff, but zero was not one of them. It hit a dead end. So are we doing okay so far? All right. So I think the most important part is not so much the mechanical aspect of how to do this. It is how the three items connect. Okay. In other words, if I were to go back to <clears throat> the tablet, the idea is what is CNF, what is proof by contradiction, and what is resolution, and how these three items are tied in together to get theorem proving done. So I think that overview of these concepts is the most important one because once you understand the overall concept, then you start to understand, oh, okay, so these are just kind of mechanical ways to get things done. But I know what we, are, what we need to be done in the first place. Do we have any questions about this topic? Because that pretty much marks the end of the module for propositional logic. No particular questions? All right. <clears throat> so in the absence of questions, oh, this is also kind of interesting. Um, someone in the uh, workshop today pointed out, you know, Devon um, is the first AGI for software engineers. 
Um, I haven't watched the video yet, so I have I really do not know anything about Devon, but I would encourage this class to kind of check it out. Okay, the name is Devon, D-E-V-I-N. Apparently, it is an AI that specifically targets software engineering, which I think is um, relevant to all of you, right? Because you know, many of you are inspiring to become software engineer. Does anyone know about Devon or have heard of Devon? Yep, okay. So what do you know about Devon? Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were doing a good job or not. I mean, it's, it's typing out code. <laughs> well, so can ChatGPT or Copilot, which is based on ChatGPT. So the question is not so much whether it can type out code. The question is, can it type out code that is on par with um, trained software engineer? So, you know, comparing to you guys is not fair because you guys are still studying or in a lower division class. Um, by the time you graduate, you know, then it will be a more fair comparison. Um, the, the issue is, you know, this, this kind of technology would also advance in the next two years. So just as you guys are moving on to a four-year university and take on the upper division classes, <laughs> the AI technology is also moving on, you know, at an exponential pace, okay? So that is that really is the challenge. And that's why it's important to keep an eye on you know, this kind of technology and find out what, what can it do, and even more importantly, what can't it do, okay? Because you, know, you want to focus on that and go like, okay, I can do what the AI cannot. And that's gonna be your ticket to be employed. Um, Okay, so well, since we are on this topic, I'm going to sidetrack just a little bit more. Um, yesterday in my lecture for CISP 310, I was sharing the statistics. Um, let me switch to my 310 note here. There we go. No. Um, nope. Okay, so I'm going to switch right here and look at job market growth and unemployment for computer science. That should find the article that I was referring to. There we go. This is it. Okay. <clears throat> so this one is interesting. It's really quite interesting. The computer science and IT job expects growth grow by 12% with 78 and employment by 2028. So a 12% growth in four years or so is high. Okay, this is a high growth area, and we know that already. Okay, the unemployment rate of 7.8% is also higher than average, which means something does not make sense here, or at least apparently it does not make sense. Because on one hand, you're looking at an industry who is in need a lot of uh, new employees. But at the same time, you're also looking at a higher than average unemployment rate within the same you know, industry. So that doesn't make sense. Now, if you're looking at a higher unemployment rate within, let's say the retail industry, we go like, yeah, we know, okay? Because you know, online merchants are taking over local retailers, right? So you know, they're now selling shoes, clothing and whatnot. You know, so a lot of the local shops, you know, kind of, you know, it's hard to compete with Amazon. So we can understand if the unemployment rate has to do with a industry where the job, you know, there's no increase of jobs, you know, the job availability is on the decline already. Then we can expect a higher than average unemployment rate. But computer science is not one of those. So the question is, how does this happen? So there are many reasons. There's another article that I found, I can share that with you uh, maybe later, not in class, that attempts to explain why that is the case. There are a few factors. One, they attribute it to um, the curriculum or the, the curricula of computer science and computer science related degrees is outdated. So when you look at you know, what you need to study in your computer science degree, you go like, really? 
are these things really kind of what I need to know, you know, in order to be employed? So that's that factor. But I think I don't think that's the only reason. Um, there's also people getting let go, you know, by Google, by you know a lot of the tech giants, and it's ongoing. So all you have to do is to look up, you know, the amount of layoffs, you know, by you know high, by the high tech company. They keep it pretty hush hush. Okay, they don't want to, you know, make it obvious, you know, to the general public. But they are cutting jobs. Okay, they are cutting jobs. So that means you know people who used to work for these you know tech giants are now you know in the job market again, and they'll be competing directly with people who just graduate. So now it doesn't mean that you know people who are just graduating are automatically at a disadvantage because they can ask for a lower salary. These people who have worked in industry for five, ten years, they're going to be asking for a higher salary. So, but nonetheless, you're still looking at a trade-off here. You know, I don't know exactly where the sweet spot is, but there is a sweet spot of you know we are willing to pay this much money. For this person who has this much experience already in industry, as opposed to someone who's fresh off of college. So anyway, I just want this to be on your radar because I think it's important to keep track of these things, you know, as you are moving on in your program. I'm not trying to discourage people from this particular program. I'm just asking you guys to be aware of what you'll be encountering by the time you graduate, so that you'll be prepared. For that day, does that make sense? Okay, I hope I hope it makes sense. Okay, <clears throat> all right. So getting back to the usual boring stuff that we talk about in this class. <laughs> I think I want to take a short break here from logic stuff and talk about numbers. What do you think? We good? Okay, so let's talk about lotto. So we're going to take a look at、um, the Powerball Lotto game. Let me. So there we go. We go to the state lottery website because you know, we want to understand how that is played, what the rules are. The next big jackpot is six hundred and eighty-seven million dollars with、uh, Powerball. Okay, this is great. Okay, this is just great. Okay, because. If this is like a hundred million dollars, then it's like it's clear that you should not be paying paying any money to, you know, play that your know, game. But six hundred eighty-seven million, it's almost like, hmm, I think I can break even. Okay, so, <laughs> no, this is apparently you might be able to break even. Okay, so so here's my idea. So the idea is,、um, I think what each ticket is what two dollars. Right? Yes. I've never played. So let's just say it is two dollars for each ticket. So if I can go to the bank and take out a loan so that I can buy every single possible ticket, then I'm guaranteed to win the jackpot along with all the other minor prizes. Right? Yes. Okay. So the bank will look at my plan and go like, "Solid. Okay, we'll give you this much money." <laughs> so what is what is the what is the flaw of my reasoning here? What am I not taking into consideration? Taxes, exactly. So how do you think I'll be taxed if I take the lump sum of six hundred and eighty-seven million dollars? I'll be, I'll be lucky to have half of it left, okay? Which means I won't have enough money to pay the bank back, okay? So the other factor is, if I can think of this idea, so can a bazillion other people, and you can have multiple jackpot winners, which means you know the prize money will be split between all the jackpot winners. And since I, but I don't have a model of how many people will have this idea, <laughs> so I cannot even figure out. Okay, what if this is not six hundred eighty-seven million dollars? What if this is like one point five billion dollars? Would I break even? I can take tax into consideration because you know, that is predictable. 
But what is not predictable is how many people will basically just go. I'm going to use the same approach. I'm going to buy every single possible ticket. Okay, so that's the fun part of it. So we'll go back and address. You know, can we even model? You know. Um, the behavior of people buying lotto ticket depending on the jackpot money. So we'll get back to that one after a little bit. So the first idea or the first um, problem that we need to solve is how many tickets are there that are unique. So in other words, if I want to go to the bank, take out a loan to buy every single possible ticket, how much money do I need? That would be the first question to answer, right? Okay. So to answer that question. We have to know the rules. So let me see. Um, menu. Do, 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 do. Second chance. Scratchers. Raw games. Close. I think the rules are explained somewhere. Right there. How to play. I like these descriptions too. They're, <clears throat> they're entertaining to read. Playing is easy. Five, easy, five simple steps using a lottery pay slip, which you can find at any lottery retailer. Pick five numbers between one and 69 and one Powerball number. Okay, so we'll focus on this sentence here. And the Powerball number is supposed to be between one and 26. So I'm just reading this one sentence here, and I'm turning this computer information science programming class into an English class and ask, how do we interpret this sentence? Pick five numbers between 1 and 69. Let's just focus on that part. Do you think I can pick like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1? What is implicit in the sentence that is not spelled out, but most people would understand it in that way? Can I pick out 1, 1, 1, 1, 1? What is implicit in this sentence is pick five unique numbers. Okay, that is implied. They never spelled it out. Okay, but it is implied. So that means, you know, out of one to 69, I'm supposed to pick five unique numbers. I can pick one, two, three, four, five. I can pick one, five, six, 10, 11, and so on. But I cannot pick one, 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 one. Is that okay? So this is an important part of you know, understanding how to count something, is whether you can have repetitions of those items. In this case, we cannot have repetitions. OK. Um, the next question, OK? Uh, we'll get to that question later. And then the second part of the same sentence says one power of number between 1 and 26. It also does not explain to you whether you can use the same number or not. And the answer is yes. So that means I can pick one, two, three, four, five as my five numbers, and then I can pick one again as my power number. So the power number has nothing to do with the five numbers that I picked earlier. Is that understood? Okay. Um, Step two, step three, so it's $2 per play or for each ticket, okay. Uh, number four, number five, okay. So what it does not say is what constitutes a match. So I'm gonna show you past winning numbers to give you a better idea of you know, you know, how, how they list the winning numbers. So this is you know, the winning numbers on March 18th, and the Powerball number is 16. Okay, so what if I have chosen on my ticket that mm, I'm, a, I'm gonna pick 44 first, and then 10, and then 20, and then 39. Would that be a match with these five numbers? In other words, what I'm really asking is the ordering, is the ordering of these five numbers significant or not. Now that part was also not really explicitly specified in the rules, and the answer is no, it is not important. In other words, um, the way I pick my numbers, if I were to write the numbers down, which I don't think that they even allow that anymore, is I can 
list these five numbers on my ticket in any order, but as long as it is the same five numbers, I will still be matching these winning numbers. Is that okay? So, is ordering important? Is a big thing. It's a very significant concept. Okay. So what have we so far? Okay, let me use、um, the <clears throat> mouse pad to describe what we have at this point. I'm gonna start a new window to do this. Okay, so basically we want to pick five unique numbers from one to sixty-nine. Ordering is not important. Then we want to pick one number from one to twenty-six. So the question is, how many ways can I do this? So what would be your approach? How would you figure out, you know, the number of ways of doing this? Well. I'm gonna look at this as a tree again. Okay, you know, tree is a very important concept in CISP 430 and in general computer science, but it's also a great visualization tool. So the first attempt of using a tree is going to be a little bit tedious. Okay, because you know, then I'll realize, ah,、uh, okay, that method does not work very well. So let me get back to the tablet screen. Nope, not this one. This one, just have to switch back to this here. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is not very, you know, productive, because what I'm going to do is to say, okay, for the first number or one of the numbers that I'm choosing, I can choose anything I want: one, two, three, all the way to sixty-nine. Okay, that's how I can choose the first ball. Okay, the first number, and. You know, once I have chosen the one, okay, now I can choose, you know, from two, three, all the way up to sixty-nine, because one is not available anymore. Once I have chosen one, then one cannot be chosen again. So that means you know I have one fewer options when I'm attempting to choose the second number. Does that make sense? Okay. So with a sixty-nine, okay, it is similar. I can choose one as the second number. I can choose two as the second number. Three all the way, but this time the last number I can choose is a sixty-eight, because sixty-nine was the first number that I have chosen. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So when you look at the tree like this, you know, and just pick any of the nodes. Let's say this two over here. So that means you know the third number that I choose here,、uh, I can still choose one. It's not chosen yet. I cannot choose two anymore, so it's a three, four, all the way up to the sixty-eight over here. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So now I can you know, expand you know, one of these again, like so. You know, I can still choose a three. I can still choose a one. I cannot choose a four anymore because you know, this four here represents four is chosen at this point. So I can do down to five, all the way up to sixty-eight, and so on. And I just need one more level, so I'm going to pick this five here. So I can still have one. I can still have three. I cannot have five anymore. I can have six, all the way up to sixty-eight, and so on. So in this particular case, okay, the the part of the tree that I have explored is choosing sixty-nine, two, four, five, and one more number. I'm going to say one at the end. Okay, all right. So that represents you know, the five individual unique numbers that I have chosen on that one ticket. Is that okay? So what I'm really asking in this case, okay, at least you know, the first thing I'm going to ask is if I complete this entire tree, which I'm not going to do, okay, how many leaves are in this tree? That really is the question because that represents the number of unique、uh, ways of choosing five items. Where ordering is important, okay? Because in this case, sixty-nine, two, four, five, one is chosen in this particular order. There are a few other paths, okay, in this tree that will choose exactly the five, the same five numbers, but in different orders, okay? 
But I don't care about that right now. Okay, I just want to look at this tree and ask how many leaves are in this particular tree. The way it's constructed using these rules. So what do you think? How do you ca calculate that one? You look at the fan out ratio at each level. Okay, at the first level, when you're looking, when you uh, when you are choosing the first number, what is the fan out? In other words, how many options do I have? Sixty nine. And once you have chosen a number, what is the fan out of the second level? Sixty eight, sixty seven, sixty six, and finally sixty what? Five. Right. Okay. So you go like, okay, so we, we have some basic idea here. So I'm going to work on the solution really, really step by step. So we can now say there are, okay, the number of ways to choose five unique numbers between 1 and 69, <clears throat> where ordering is important, is as follows, okay? 69 times 68 times 67 times 66 times 65. Is that okay so far? Okay. You look at this and go like, but tech, that cannot be the answer because you just mentioned earlier that ordering should not be important, right? <sighs> okay. So now the question is, how many of these are duplicates of each other? Because I have to, once I know, how many way how many how many of these are duplicates then i can just divide this number by the number of duplicates then i get the number of unique ones right okay so at this point it is difficult to visualize because uh, because of the massive branch out thing you cannot just look at the whole thing and go like oh okay i see it because you cannot see it okay it's just too many so one trick that i personally use a lot when I'm trying to solve a problem, is to scale it all the way down to something that I can visualize, that I can just use my hand, use a paper, use a piece of paper, use a pencil, and work out every single possible case so I can spot patterns. Okay? So I'm gonna go like, okay, let's forget about, forget about this problem. Okay, we'll simplify the problem a little bit here. So we'll say you'll know, pick three unique numbers from one to uh, I think five is probably okay. Let's down scale that down a little bit more. Three, one, two, five. We'll we'll try this. Okay, we'll try this this one because I want to spot patterns. Okay, so um, let me go back to my tablet, which is in here. So we'll see whether we can make this one a little bit more easy to visualize. But I think. I think we're good here. I think we can we can visualize this one. Okay. So uh, getting back to, I want to show the tablet here, and we'll maximize the screen too. Okay. F eleven. Oh. I can always do that. Okay. All right, so the first number, I got five choices. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. At the second level, we got four choices each. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yeah, even this one, I think it's not going to be very easy to visualize because it's, it's still too many. The fan out is too many. So we got two, three, four, five here. One, two, three, four, five here. One, two, three, four, five here. One, two, three, four, five here. And then finally, we have one, two, three, four here. Okay. And at the third level, as I said, you know, this is already a little too dense you know, to be to be seen, you know, to be to work on it by hand. So now we have one, two, and then three, four, five. And then here we have one, two, three, four, five. And then here we have one, two, three, four, five. And then here we have one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So even this one is a little bit too much, you know, because I can't really finish the entire thing and still make it legible. So I'm only going to 
So I'm going to downscale one more time. Okay, I'm going to downscale this so that I can at least you know, visualize the whole thing. So getting back to the text description, because I want to describe you know what I'm doing here. So this time I'm going to pick you know, two unique numbers from one to four. So I'm both scaling the number of unique numbers that I'm picking, but I'm also limiting my choices from you know I'm downsizing from five down to four. Okay, so let's go back and try this one again. So this time we only got four to choose from, and we're choosing two out of four. So I think this is much doable, much more doable. So we got four to begin with, one, two, three, four, and at a second level, we got uh, two, three, four over here. We got one, two, three, four. And then here we got one, two, three, four. And then here we got one, two, three, four. Okay. Okay. That's that's a whole lot better, right? Okay. But you can see that some of these are duplicates. In other words, if ordering is not important, then some of these are kind of like, well, they give you the same outcome. Okay. They, they, it's exactly the same thing. Like this one, two here. Okay. This is one, two. It's the same thing as one, two over here. Because if, if ordering is not important, then these things should be considered the same. Does that make sense? So what about one, three? Same thing. So one, three over here is three, one over here. One, four is four, one over here, and so on. So it looks to me that every way of picking two specific number, there are exactly two ways to reorder them. Is that okay? And once I know that there are two ways of reordering things, and there are how many ways here? Four times three is 12. So that means I have only six ways of arranging, you know, picking the numbers when ordering is not important and six i got six because it's 12 divided by two does that make sense to you so the 12 is the total number of leaves in the tree the two is looking at each way of you know, picking the numbers and ask how many ways can i change the ordering of those things is that okay so by dividing the total number of leaves by the number of duplicates of those leaves, because you know, those are representing exactly the same numbers, just ordered differently, then I get the total number of unique way of picking numbers where ordering is not important. So does everybody understand the approach of this one? Okay, all right. So then the next question is to generalize this whole thing. So the first, Generalization we want to say is so given um, n items, what is the number of ways to rearrange the ordering? That's the first question I need to answer. What do you think? In other words, in my pocket, there are five marbles, okay? And I'm going to take out all five marbles out of my pocket. But I want to understand how many ways can I arrange those five marbles in terms of the ordering. What would be the answer to that question? Factorial. Very good. OK. It's n factorial. OK. The answer here is n factorial. Why is it n factorial? OK. The exclamation point. So this is n factorial. n factorial is the answer. Why is that the case? Because the first marble coming out of my pocket, I have all five marbles you know, that, that can be my choices. The next one, I only got four choices. The next one, I only got three choices. The next one, I only got two choices. And then when I have one, only one marble left, it's just one. I don't, I don't really have a choice there, okay? Because whatever is left in my pocket is the marble that I'm going to choose. So that ex does that explain why it is n factorial? Okay, great. That is good. 
Then the next question is um, given n items, we need to uh, pick m of them. Ordering is important. How many ways? Can we choose these M items? Okay, so that goes back to the question that we saw already. So the way this works looks like this, okay? So it looks like, you know, the first item, we got N choices because, you know, we have not chosen anything yet, right? For the second item, we have N minus one, right? And then for the next item, we got n minus 2, and so on. And then we're going to end with n minus m plus 1. Does that make sense to you? That this number here is the number of ways to choose to pick um, m items out of n where ordering is important? Well, okay. So N, M, you know, these are all pretty abstract stuff. But we worked out an example already earlier, right? Because we said that there are 69 numbers from 1 to 69. We're supposed to choose, what, five out of them? And we came to the conclusion of, oh, it, the answer is 69 times 68 times 67 and so on. So let's plug that in here and see whether this makes sense or not. So when N is 69 and M is 5, which is the lot of problem, does that match the answer that we have here? So we got 69, 68, 67, and then the last number that we're going to multiply is 69 minus the 5 plus the 1, which is 65. Huh, I think that's what we got, right? So I think most people can understand the n minus m part, why do we have a plus one here? Why does not it why does it end with just n minus m, but why do we have a plus one? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly the, the reason. Okay. All right. So that means you know, now we have some generalization, right? So now we go like, and by the way, um, when we use the term combination, then ordering is not important. When we use the term permutation, permutation, then ordering is important okay so just kind of terms that we want to you know be clear about is a combination is a way of collecting items or picking items where ordering is not important and then permutation is doing the same thing but ordering is important okay so <clears throat> so in this case you'll know, see there are many ways to represent this um, c of n m is the number of combinations to choose m out of oops out of n and then p n m oops p n m is the number of permutations permutations to I'm going to use the word pick instead of choose just so that you know it is different okay all right so we have just worked out what is p okay so p of n m is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times blah 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 all the way down to n minus m plus 1 okay are we good so far in terms of just notation? 
So I have not introduced a single new concept other than the notation, okay? So P and M is just the number of permutations when you have a total of N things, but you're supposed to pick M out of them and ordering is important. Is that good? Is that okay? All right? I don't like this. This doesn't look very concise, okay? So what is the other way to write this? You are uh, divided by M factorial. But let's, let's not go there yet, okay? So let's go ahead and use a pi notation. Does everybody know what is the pi notation? Okay, let me give you the whole thing, and then you tell me whether this is familiar to you or not. So in this case, I is starting with n minus m plus 1, going all the way to n, and each term that we're multiplying is just i itself. Okay, so are we familiar with this notation of using pi, which is kind of like the counterpart of sigma? With sigma, we are adding. With pi, we are multiplying. Is that okay? Okay. So how do you remember that? You know, how do you remember sigma is for adding and then pi is for multiplying? Why do you think they pick sigma? Sigma starts with S, sum starts with S too. Why do we use pi? Product, okay? So product, pi, and then sum is sigma, okay? All right, you look at this and go like, well, it looks a little better, but it still looks ugly. So now I look at this and go like, hmm, what if I am to multiply this with pi of i going from n, oops, sorry, going from 1 to n minus m of i divided by itself. i goes from 1 to n minus m, and this is just i itself too, okay? You guys go like, okay, tech, you know, we are, this is not wrong, okay? But it looks kind of stupid, okay? Because I'm just saying, um, do you think multiplying by one is not gonna change the value of what we started off with? The answer is clearly, okay? Yeah, we can multiply anything by one and not change the value. So now we use association, so the way I use association is to say, okay, let's put everything um, in the numerator together. Okay, so this is one. This is the other one. I starts, okay, I here. I starts with one, ends with n minus m, and also i. This is my numerator. And then the denominator is just, you know, i starting from one, ending with n minus m of i. So are, you, are we still buying this? Okay, so I'm just changing the ordering a little bit here by using association. Is that okay? All right, look at the top. What is it? All right, so it starts off with um, i is 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up to n minus m, which means this part is just n minus m, the whole thing factorial, right? And then on this side, I'm starting from where this one left off. Because the last number that got multiplied on the right-hand side is n minus m. This one starts with n minus m plus 1 and works its way all the way up to n. Don't you think the entire numerator is just n factorial? Yes? Okay. What about the bottom? Uh, how about we just call it n minus m the whole thing factorial. So this is this is basically the closed form of the number of permutations when you need to choose m, when you need to pick m out of n items. Are we good so far? All right. Then how are we going to express the number of combinations when we need to choose m out of n? What was the strategy that we used earlier? We look at the total no number of permutations, and then we look at each unique combination and ask, 
how many ways can we rearrange these things? In other words, we already worked out the number of permutations per combination. And what was that number again? If I have m items in a combination, how many permutations can I generate out of that one combination? m factorial, very good. So that means your C of nm is really P of nm divided by m factorial. And if you want the entire thing, you know, it is n factorial divided by n minus m factorial times m factorial as a part of the denominator. Are we good so far with the P of nm and then the C of nm? Sort of, sort of, okay, all right. So once we have the critical abstract you know, description of things, then we want to plug it in to something that was concrete, something that we worked out already, okay, and see whether that works out or not. So the first thing we're gonna do is to ask, what is the P of, let's say we start with four items and we want to pick two of them where ordering is important. Okay, according to the definition of the uh, P term you know, that we saw earlier, this is four factorial divided by four minus two, the whole thing factorial. Four factorial is 24, and then the bottom we have four minus two, which is two factorial, is just two, and that is supposed to be 12. So the, we count 12 leaves in the earlier tree where we are supposed to pick two items out of four. Okay, that seems to work out, right? So this is a really important step when you're trying to understand a concept, is to start with a concrete example that you can work out by hand, so they can visualize, so you can, you can actually see the pattern. Then you generalize into an equation, so it is abstract, using a lot of symbols. Then you go back again, plug that equation back in, and make sure that it works for the example that you already worked out by hand. That way, you make connections between the concepts and also the things that you just worked out. Okay, it's important. What about C of 4, 2? Well, according to what we saw earlier, this is 24 divided by 2 times 2. In other words, this 2 here is m factorial. Okay, so that gives us 6. The question is, did we actually count num the six unique combinations in that tree, we didn't actually do that. So let's go back and work on that one. <clears throat> All right, so we identify one, two is one combination. Uh, we identify one, three as a combination, one, four as a combination, two, three is a combination, two, four is a combination, and then three, four is also a combination. There are four, there are six of them. Okay, are we good so far? Yeah, we are counting combinations here. So when I use combination, I'm going to use a set notation because elements in a set, it makes sense because you know, the ordering of elements in a set is not significant. And that's why I use the set notation when I need to represent combinations. But there are six combinations in this case, even though there are 12 permutations. Are we seeing all that? So if this is making sense to you, let me go back to this part here. Hmm, okay, the number seems to all work out. Excellent. Because now I can plug in the bigger problem that we were trying to solve, okay? Because we are still looking at a combination problem because you know, the ordering of numbers on your lotto ticket is not significant. We only want to know what five, what those five numbers are. We don't care about the ordering within those five numbers. So now we are looking at, we got 69 numbers to choose from. We want five of them, okay? So that becomes 69 factorial divided by 64 factorial and five factorial here, okay? That's a huge number. We'll work this, we'll work out the actual number later. So that accounts for the number of ways to choose five numbers, but this does not take into consideration of the power number. The power number is completely independent and there are 26 of them. So that means the total number of 
Powerball lotto tickets is C of 69.5 times 26. The 26 is easy to explain because for each way that you choose the five numbers, there are 26 ways to choose the Powerball number. That's why we just multiply by 26. All right, so we're going to plug this in and see whether this works or not. So let me get out of that mode. And we're going to use, I got enough time to do this. <clears throat> All I need is a spreadsheet. If you have not been using a lot of spreadsheets, you might want to consider doing that because you know it's free, it's Google Sheets, and it can do computations. And it's easy to replicate the computation to another you know, spreadsheet and so on. So the combination thing, the C function is called combin. And you know, his N, which is the total number of things, 69 of them, of which I want to choose five. K is the number of items that we are choosing. And we want to multiply this whole thing by 26 because there are 26 power numbers. So that number is relatively large. We have 292 million okay, of ways to choose those five numbers. So this means if I take out a bank you know, loan right now and buy every single possible lotto ticket, I can do that already. I know how much it's going to cost me. So because you know, each ticket costs you know, about two bucks, so if I multiply this by two, this is the, the amount of money I need in order to buy every single possible ticket. Okay, It's $584 million. But the jackpot is already more than that. So if people are not careful in their thinking, <laughs> taking taxes into consideration, taking multiple jackpot into consideration, some people may actually say, oh, Let's go and do it. Let's go borrow, you know, some hundreds of millions of dollars and do this. I mean, Elon Musk can, can totally do this just for the sake of it, just for the heck of it. He's like, okay, it's less than a billion dollars. I, I'll just go ahead and do it. <clears throat> I think we should challenge the billionaires to do this. <laughs> <clears throat> Just to show the math of doing this, right? So the chances of you winning the jackpot if you're not buying every single possible ticket is one divided by this number because this is the total number of possible tickets. If you were to buy one single ticket, one divided, divided by this number, let me just give you the order of magnitude here. <clears throat> one divided by this. <laughs> That is your chances of winning the jackpot if you are to buy a single ticket. Okay? So are we good so far in terms of you know, understanding the concepts of whether ordering is important or not? And whether we can whether we are choosing unique items out of a collection or not, um, and how we do the counting. Are those concepts okay? So let me show you where we are in the notes because I never once you know, in today's lecture refer to the notes, but I think it's important to do that. Um, so we are in discrete probability and we are on this module called simply called counting. So if you are have the time to read a little bit you know, over the weekend, it'll be great. Okay, because now that we have the example, um, understanding the concepts, the words, the equations, the symbols should become a little bit easier. And I will finish up the homework assignment for resolution later today. You should see an announcement by the end of today. If not, send me a little nudge. Okay, you say, Tack, you know, you kind of said that we'll have a new homework assignment. So I'll be working on that one too. All right, so I'll see all of you next Monday. Have a nice weekend. I heard it's going to rain over the weekend. So, yeah. Yeah, colder and rainy, you know, over the weekend. So all this sun and nice weather during the, the week, it's just a teaser. <laughs> Comes Friday, you know, the, the weather goes like, just kidding. <laughs> Not happening. Mm.